Okay, thank you very much. So can I ask each of you to sort of briefly introduce yourselves in, in your companies and let our audience know a little bit about what you do? Can I go first? Sure. Hi, I'm Amanda Kalo. I'm the CEO and founder of a company called Sixth Sense. We are an AI company for B2B sales and marketing. So essentially think about when you're in B2C and you're getting ready to buy a pair of shoes and every company sells those shoes, knows you're in market to buy. Imagine for a B2B company, knowing exactly when your customers are ready to buy from you, what their needs are, their wants are, how to reach them with the right message. That's essentially what we're doing with AI. Cool. Hey, everybody. Michael Litt, uh, co-founder and CEO of Vidyard. Uh, Vidyard is a video platform for business. Uh, we help marketers and sales professionals uh, use video to drive pipeline through personalized video. Um, we've got a pre free product called Viewdit, which sales teams use to um, create personalized prospecting initiatives with customers. We can also personalize video at scale. So um, we're really all about, about pipeline. The company is five years old. Uh, we're about 250 employees, and uh, we've raised just north of uh, $60 million to date. Okay. So walk me through, either one of you, we'll start this off, the first steps of creating a customer pipeline. Yeah, I think... Um, <laughs> It's probably useful to get really tactical here, given, given I think, the stage of, of companies in the audience. So um, I work with a lot of early stage companies um, trying to solve this problem specifically. Um, we were just talking backstage about the situation where every startup has a massive TAM. You've got this huge opportunity. Um, that opportunity is what attracts venture capital. It's what attracted you to uh, the overcoming the challenge in the first place. But it's very difficult to actually find out who you need to sell to. Um, and one of the things we did uh, very early to develop Pipeline is we actually built a crawler. And I, I think it'll feed really well into what Amanda does now because they've figured out how to productize this. It didn't exist when we started. We built a crawler to scan the DMOS for every website on the internet that had a video hosted uh, on the homepage. And we crawled the sitemap and found all the videos listed. And then we uh, took the data from Crunchbase and from LinkedIn and sorted those companies. And we were in Silicon Valley at Y Combinator at the time, and what I would do is develop a list of 100 companies that I wanted to interact with the next day, and develop a list of the people in those companies that I wanted to talk to, and we would offshore that list um, to someone on Odesk that would find the contact information for those individuals, and the next day I would contact them, and then perform the follow-ups, and I would do 100 a day, and we did this for six months. And that's how we built our initial pipeline and in understanding what we needed to build based on having conversations with those customers, but also the propensity triggers and what potentially would drive someone to, to buy our technology. Um, and the reality is, is we haven't stopped doing that. Uh, that pipeline program is still a massive part of our go-to-market strategy. Uh, just instead of me performing that outreach and those calls, we have a team of BDRs and SDRs um, that business development reps and sales development reps that do that on behalf of the organization. Um, and then those leads and those companies uh, backfill into all of our demand gen programs, our growth programs, et cetera. Yeah, so I'll put in a tactical story um, of a customer of ours. So when we first started, started out, Cisco was one of our first customers. And if you think about Cisco and their TAM, their size of their market, their TAM is every B2B company on the planet. They sell to everyone who needs networking, who needs wireless, unified communications. So the question is, how do they find those companies right now that are ready to switch over from Juniper, ready to switch from something else, and they actually have a need to grow or expand their networking? So what we started doing was we, we actually started with something similar that Michael talked about. We started looking at the profile of the companies that were buying from Cisco. And most internal models, if you talk to enterprise companies, they're doing propensity to buy models and lifetime value models. They're looking at the size of the wallet. They're looking at their the products, the past product purchase history, what they bought in the past, what other products and technologies, what companies we should sell to. But what we found is when you go into those companies just on their lookalike, their DNA of who they are, that actually doesn't say they have a need right now for networking. They might look exactly like somebody else you sold to and have all the right profile attributes, firmographic, demographic attributes of those companies and the right people. But guess what? You knock on their door, they're not there, they don't have a need, they're really happy with Juniper. So we had to take it to another level. And this was actually, Cisco called this a 12-year uh, science project. So it actually went on for about 12 years in my past life. And we were just testing all kinds of different things. And what we realized was one of the key signals to knowing when to talk to somebody was simply looking at their intent. Were they actually doing research? We were all walking around with supercomputers in our pockets, right? You all have them here, you have your phones. I have actually three screens here as I travel the world. 
And that supercomputer is leaving a rich digital trace of exactly what I want and need as a consumer and as a B2B buyer, as a CEO of an enterprise technology company. Right? So as these, these trace and as I'm going out and doing this research, we're simply listening to those signals. So think about listening to when somebody's searching. They're searching or going on Google and they're saying, I need networking or I'm looking for how to increase my pipeline, right? Or I'm looking how to increase the efficiencies of my marketing tactics. Then I go to, they end up on Sixth Sense's website. Then they respond to your email and they get in your marketing automation system and then your salesperson engages with them. All of those little signals are traces that they're interested in those products that you sell. So if we can connect that footprint of your buyer across all these different channels, you can hone in on exactly who has a need for that of which you're selling. So rather than going out and here's my TAM, here's my total addressable market. No, find somebody who actually has a need. I call it empathetic marketing. Get in the minds and the heads and the hearts of your buyers and connect to their needs and you will exponentially increase your pipeline and your revenue as a result. Yeah, and I think something I'd add to that, which is where our program uh, failed and we needed to improve it, is uh, a serious decision stat. Um, which has been around oh, for serious. like three years. <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, but it's this concept that 70% uh, of the purchase decision has been made before that person even talks to someone inside of your company. So it's all the research. It's that digital trace. Um, and it took us a while to figure that out. Uh, but that's the benefit of all of your content programs and demand gen programs and all the stuff that you put out there on the internet is ultimately part of the sales process today. And um, I think it's very difficult to understand that early stage when you don't even have that, that trace to start with, right? Um, so it's all about that initial grind and then leaving that. Uh, but you do have a little trace. Content. Like imagine just even knowing, like looking at your web activity. So I always look at analytics. Like you, were, you said you went out and did a crawler and you looked at who's engaging with your content. Who's coming to your site, right? When, I have, when I'm sitting here talking to you right now, how many people go to sixcents.com and then start doing research on who we are and how we might be able to help you accelerate your pipeline? So just simply listening to, even if it's a small set of signals and you're not buying a multi-million dollar solution like ours, you can still listen to those signals that you have in your marketing automation, in your email systems, and start to understand who's engaging with you and who actually has a need. And then you start to build on top of it um, and see that whole footprint of the buyers prior to raising their hand. Buyers are in control today. Yesterday, the sales guy had a nice meal with a steak and they were in control. Today, buyers, the last thing you want to do is talk to a salesperson, right? So we have to listen and let buyers buy the way they want to buy rather than forcing ourselves upon them when the conversation isn't the right time. So what are the costs involved in lead development? What's the cost? The cost. Yeah. <laughs> so then we get into attribution and all sorts of inter <laughs> interesting stuff. Um, so lead development is expensive. And I think the, the point of this discussion is that the cost of developing leads and developing pipelines is increasing over time as the market becomes more competitive. And a lot of you probably have competitors in market. Some of them maybe have more funding. Some of them are stuffing more money into marketing channels. And uh, if you were here for Gary's talk yesterday, um, growth and pipeline development um, tends to be today more about developing really contextual experiences for your buyers that don't have to be super high cost, that don't have to stuff money into tradi traditional marketing channels like advertising, et cetera. Um, and one of the ways we think of growth at Vidyard and, and, and pipeline development um, specifically for our, our free products and kind of our flywheel bottoms up stuff because we have a free product uh, which people use and we sell into the enterprise. We also have a top down model where we have salespeople reaching out, running traditional demand gen programs, et cetera. And that bottom up process is actually more effective um, and drives our cost of acquiring a lead um, and therefore pipeline down to zero. Um, and one of the things that, that we found really works for us um, and it tends to be what we do and we've almost developed products around it, um, is this concept of, of, of video and, and video marketing specifically. Uh, and the interesting point to make there is video doesn't have to be expensive. It doesn't have to be Super Bowl quality. You don't have to go and spend $25,000 producing content. Um, what we find is one of the uh, most cost-effective methods of developing pipeline and leads is just by having someone on your team uh, sit down in front of a webcam and describe what they're doing um, with the benefit of the person on the other end of the screen and creating that personalized experience, write their name on a whiteboard, send them that video because ultimately that creates a vanity trigger. And the only cost of developing that lead and developing that relationship and finding that person was um, the cost of that individual's time, which could be five, maybe 10 minutes. Um, but empathy and that vanity trigger is, is becoming more and more important in pipeline. Um, 
to answer the question generally, though, like I think attribution is, is really difficult um, because when we look at every single thing that a customer might do before they purchase our product, we don't really know what was the one thing that made them buy. And so we have this massively blended marketing program. Our budget this year is $20 million in marketing. Um, and we know what we're going to produce from that in net new ARR. And that's our blended cost of customer acquisition. But figuring out which programs inside of that campaign are the ones that are actually driving the highest quality pipeline is a massive challenge at scale. Yeah, and I think there's two things. So like we touch on attribution and measuring costs all the way through. I think the challenge prior to today is that when you try to measure costs, most of your marketing dollars and your early sales development dollars, you can't measure. So you all do all this blind. Buyers are out there doing their research anonymously, right? So if they're engaging with your content, a multi-billion dollar industry when we create content, you don't know that they're actually doing it because they're not raising their hand. Who in here likes to fill out forms and raise their hand to become a quote unquote lead? I don't see anybody raising their hand. Nobody wants to fill out a form. However, B2B marketing is hinged on this concept that we have to fill out this form, give our personal information, who wants to do that, and then get called, because you know once you're going to fill out that form, you're going to get spammed with email, because none of us like email, and you're going to get called. So even more reason why not to give that information. So if we can listen to signals, listen to the anonymous signals without asking somebody to have to fill out that form, and then measure that measure the activity and the engagement with the anonymous activity, whether it be with the videos that they're engaging with. Don't pick, make it gated. Let them, let your buyers know why. As marketers and salespeople, yeah. your job is to evangelize your product and say why your product is 10 times better than the market leader out there and why they should buy you and you fit for their industry and their vertical and their needs. But we stick it behind this content, this form, where then nobody wants to do it. So you're actually in this, uh, you're, this dichotomy where you're sitting there, I need to get leads. And then you also want to make it so people can actually read about your products. So imagine a world where you can lift that gate, let people read about your content, understand and connect those signals, know that they're in market, then reach out to them because they're now engaging. They're watching your videos, they're reading your content, they're going to your website, they're doing everything they need to do without forcing them to do something that it, by human nature is against our nature to push all the way through. So yeah. I think the question of attribution too, people are trying to get to each of the individual channels. But it is a mix. And so you have to tie it all together. You can't just look at the hand raisers on. You have to look at all the anonymous activity because 90% of the buyer's journey of that 70% is anonymous. And so you have to look at the full picture to really understand what's working. So that is, you know, at the end of the day, pulling it all together. And you can do it in bits and pieces on your own. You actually don't need technology necessarily. I mean, I'd love for everybody to buy six cents, but you don't need a sophisticated technology to get a bit of that signal to understand where should I focus my efforts? Who should I be calling this week? When we started just looking at our own data of who's researching Six Sense and our competitors, I simply look at every week our sales team looks at who's looking for Lattice Engines because they're one of our biggest competitors. And they are on that and calling those companies right away. And our conversions on that are exponentially higher than just trying to blindly go after we want to sell to tech companies yeah. or manufacturing companies, et cetera, because they're in market. They're looking at our competitors. They're looking at our product set. They're doing research. So now is the time that we should pick up that phone and we'll be more likely to convert that all the way through. Mm -hmm. So See, it sounds like data is economy. really the key here. <laughs> you know, and data science is really the, the, the starting point. A okay. hundred percent. Yeah. Data is everything. And, you know, it used to be about structured data. And the reason now we can do what we do, which we couldn't do before, is in past lives, we had to work in relational data warehouses where everything was in structures and cubes. And now with big data, you have unstructured data. You can access it and query and dimensional queries to get the answer to what you need at any given time. And you can keep it in a, a form that you can tie all these different sources of data together. You can have multiple keys. And then you can layer in things like AI and math on top of it to actually provide that intelligence. Five years ago, we weren't there. So t we've always had the data, but we haven't been able to process it in a really smart way. For example, at Sixth Sense, we're processing 90 billion rows of behavioral data a day. So, and then, and that can't be in structures and cubes. There's no way in human nature we could actually hold that data in that way. So how do you do that in a scrappy and like effective and early way? I would say just start with something simple like looking at your web logs. What companies are coming to your website, right? There are technologies right now that tell you who's coming to your website. And then tying back, you can do some cookie analysis. Like if you had a smart marketer, they can do some cookie pooling and tie and do some cookie syncing between different sources to know that it was this company and this role within this company. 
Like right now they're researching, like we just, I'm proud to say that we just got put in the top right hand corner of Forrester's quadrant of our space. I want to know who's looking at that. I'm not going to put it behind a form because I, you know, my marketing team wants me to. I won't put it behind a form, but I will know what companies and what role within those companies. And a smart marketer can do that today. And then those lists can generate the leads, like just like when you were crawling your, your website yeah. itself. Yeah, it's, I, I think to your point, it's, um, it, the world is an attention economy right now. And so people are going to be spending time with your web products, your sites, your Twitter feed, uh, your YouTube channel, um, Instagram, all these types of things. And these are all strong signals that people are investing time and energy into your brand and your experience. Um, and you have to capitalize on that. Um, and that's the way sales are done um, in B2B and B2C. And I think um, being a primarily B2B company, we've seen a massive shift in the way people buy um, based on the research they're doing ahead of time. And consumerization of the enterprise is um, you know, not a buzzword for no reason. Um, consumers are coming into the workplace, the digital natives, the video natives, people that are are used to consuming content um, to be sold to by consumer brands um, are doing that for B2B businesses. So I think no matter what type of company you are, who you sell to specifically, um, it's really about understanding that intent. Understand those triggers for your market, right? So it might be something different. Yeah. Like you said, crawling worked for you to understand somebody has a video on their web page. So you know, that's not something that's going to be universal to our, all of our customers. So it's not something we actually even offer as a, a, a data point yeah. um, when we're doing our modeling. But it's huge to his business. So what is it that really aligns? So take yourself out of the technology and ask yourself, what is it that really aligns to our buyers? What do they need or what do they do? Or what kinds of things are happening when they're in market to buy and they would buy our products? What would make them that now is the right time to talk to them and see if there are data signals that can point you in that direction? Mm -hmm. Okay, we've got about 13 seconds left. Just one uh, quick thing. What is the biggest mistake that you see early startups making in developing their pipeline? Is there like a one word answer in the last few seconds? Yeah, so uh, run a small fund um, that has invested in about 60 companies and um, most of these are B2B SaaS companies that we really try to help get to a million dollars in ARR. And the one thing that we see companies do is um, fail to interpret the signals or try to lean back and understand that people are just going to come and buy their product without a content strategy, without a demand gen strategy. So the advice I gave at the, at the beginning rings true. I know people don't want to talk to you on the phone. I know people don't want to respond to email. Email marketing is a victim of its own success, but <laughs> you have to put yourself out there and talk to as many people as possible at conferences, at events, pick up the phones, get on email, because unless you have those initial interactions, you can't develop the basis of understanding the propensity triggers of why someone is going to want to buy your stuff to go and scale it using the data models, et cetera, down the line. Okay. Thank you very much. We're out of time, but this is a very good panel. So Thank you. Thank you cool. for your time. Awesome.